Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the Cypher webinar on inbound patent assertion, uh, economic downturn triggering, triggering an increased recession. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be moderating this panel rather than presenting it, and even greater pleasure to uh, have my co-founder, Steve Harris, CTO of Cypher, with me on this call. Uh, but it wouldn't have been possible uh, without Kasper uh, Gorski, who's one of our senior solutions analysts, who has actually been delivering this solution for clients. So uh, in order to get this session underway, what I'd like to happen here is maybe, Steve, you could do a short presentation on the background, and then Kasper, if you could present the solution, and then we'll uh, lead into more of a discussion. Steve. Hi. So um, yeah, we're going to talk. A, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, what we can learn from history and um, look at some trends that have happened following previous recessions, so that we can get some idea of the sort of um, sort of uh, change in the assertion landscape that we expect to see. Um, and then Casper is going to talk a little bit about um, ways in which you can effectively respond to some of these assertions and. Give an example, a hypothetical example of what that looks like. Um, so this is a chart showing um, previous US recessions in pink overlaid with the, um, the number of litigations. Now, obviously, litigations and assertions aren't, aren't exactly the same thing. There's some, there's some disconnect there and some delay as well. But from previous research, we know that um, Roughly 30% of all assertions end up in a in a litigation, and um, the last two major um, recessions that we had resulted in the same bump in um, litigation numbers, which obviously was preceded by some much larger number, roughly three times as many um, assertions. And as it happens, after the last two recessions we had roughly the same increase over five years of uh, approximately six to 7,000 assertions. So it seems likely that we might see the same thing over the next, over the next five years. This data is only looking at OPCO, um, um, OPCO plaintiffs with OPCO defendants, because obviously if you overlay the MPE data as well, you get some, some other trends emerging, which sort of, slightly mask out the signal, but I think you can see there's a, a quite clear um, peak in litigation following following recessions, and it doesn't appear to be a uh, quirk in the data, it does appear to be a robust signal. Um, the uh, Which sort of backs up people's intuition that um, recessions are followed by an increase in monetization activity, which ultimately ends up in assertions and litigation. It kind of makes sense if you've got companies with uh, financial trouble, then they're gonna try and um, get revenue from new sources and uh, monetizing their patent portfolio is an obvious way to do that. So, it, but it's kind of interesting to test these theories out and um, see if we can see hard evidence that supports it. Um, there's another evidence point we've got as well, which relates more to the to the current time period. We can see that there's a, a quite a large quantity of new um, patents being made available to patent assertion entities. Um, and that's coming in rather than sort of typical recirculation process, which happens when PAEs shift patents between them or buy them off each other. We can see that there has been a big bump in the um, the feed coming in from operating companies, which is another indicator that we might be about to see um, a rise in assertions where we've got new material coming on coming into the hands of PAEs. It's reasonable to assume that they're not acquiring that for fun, and they they do intend to to assert that that new um, assets that they're acquiring. Um, and now um, the talking a little bit about what what happens when you receive an assertion. There's really two cases, and there was a really interesting study um, in Stanford Law, um, which broke down a lot of um, sort of obviously um, anonymous data from companies that contributed to the study. But one of the interesting things that comes out is that there's 
this sharp divide between the sort of typical a uh, very small number of um, assets being asserted against uh, against an operating company versus hundreds or thousands. And it's quite a sharp divide. There's very little um, cases where it was kind of dozens. It tended to be either be one, two, three, maybe five, or it was into the hundreds or into the thousands. And this, um, the case where there's a very large portfolio being asserted was approximately 41% of the cases in the study. Um, and this is quite an interesting additional challenge because not only do you have to deal with the working out how you're going to respond to the assertion, but you've also got this data challenge of trying to assess what's quite often a very large portfolio in terms of how relevant that is to your um, to your business and how you should respond to it, which gives you an additional challenge. So it's not just reading three or four patents to try and figure out um try and figure out how how concerning they are when you've got this very very large number it's um it's really quite difficult it's, you don't you don't really have the time or resources to go through them one by one and claims chart them or anything like that so it requires a slightly different approach to to responding to the uh, to the asserter and uh now i'm going to hand over to casper who's going to talk more about ways you can do that yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Steve. I mean, you took the the words right out of my mouth. It's that challenge of you have limited time to respond to the asserter and you have limited resources uh, where you're facing hundreds or thousands uh, of patents being asserted against you, where typically, you know, you might bucket them into relevant and not relevant, spending, say, five minutes reading them. You, you're not going to get the same uh, level of detail as you can with uh, with machine learning. So that's really where the Cypher solution comes in. It's our uh, machine learning that can crunch through up to uh, 60 million patents an hour uh, that will give you that really granular view uh, rather than just relevant and not relevant. You'll get exactly where it is relevant and how relevant it is to your portfolio as well as some other uh, factors that you can take a look at as well. So the process really starts with uh, running uh, these asserted patents through the portfolio you have uh, with us within Cypher. That's the classifiers that we've trained and built for you to your exacting scope. And that is the best possible lens to view these assets through. Uh, it's the clearest one as to what's relevant to your technologies uh, and the areas you operate. So you're going to get a, a chunk uh, of uh, patterns that are going to be relevant to you and you're going to get a chunk that are irrelevant to you. Uh, the next step is we're going to cluster those uh, irrelevant patterns that fall outside of your core technologies. And uh, we're going to use the unsupervised machine learning algorithm here, which will look for any similarities between the pattern documents. Um, and again, we're going to get a chunk that's uh related to you this is what we call these uh adjacent technologies and you're going to get another chunk uh so this is the second unrelated chunk uh and finally in, our, in that step we take that uh that unrelated chunk again and we use our uh, more standardized ast product taxonomy which is a very broad uh product level uh classifiers and we run over uh, the unrelated for a final time uh, just to check on, on on the boundary of exactly what we're going to present you with. Uh, the bottom line here is that this means uh, that anything that falls outside of these three steps is going to be unrelated to your business uh, or your technologies uh, and you can uh, basically use that to try and um, you can use that information to try and uh, rationalize the conversation around licensing uh, and how you'd like to respond to the asserter. So Steve, if you could switch over to the next slide. Uh, what we can present here is um, a worked example. So this is uh, an anonymized company working in the financial services. And we uh, did these exact three steps uh, using the public uh, assets that we know about the intellectual ventures hold which is about four and a half thousand as a stand-in for the client taxonomy we used our fintech uh, taxonomy we think this is a 
a pretty good appro uh, appropriate use case for this. It's quite a narrow set of classifiers that will uh, zero in um, on exactly what's relevant. And you can see that reflected here with this 8% chunk uh, being the relevant, highly relevant assets. So they, these are your top priority uh, to take a look at. Secondly, it's the clustering here. Uh, is this adjacent technologies? That's the 17% here. Uh, and that's uh, using uh, this, uh, what we call client A and intellectual ventures. We can uh, cluster the two together, look for similarities between documents. Uh, that's this along with the AST taxonomy is more the uh, amber, if you like. If the client taxonomy was the red light, uh, this is the amber light. And then the unrelated, which here, is the vast majority of these assets, 64%, um, is the green light, excuse me, green light. Um, and it's all well and good having this data uh, and presenting a nice pie chart, but you know you have to have uh, the data underneath to back it up. So if we could uh, click onto the next slide, thank you. Um, what we can see here is exactly the data we saw previously. Now we've removed the uh, unrelated uh, from this view, and we're just looking at uh, the the red zone and the amber zone uh, of relevance to you. Um, on the right, in this sort of purplish red, uh, is the client taxonomy. You can see how it's broken down into more discrete categories, uh, such as you know you could imagine how cloud computing, cellular technologies, and encryption might be um, pretty relevant to uh, a financial services uh, company that's operating these days. Secondly, and this is a quirk of the Excel tree map that we've used, um, but secondly is these adjacent technologies that might be uh, more on the edge of relevance to you. And those include payment processing. I don't know if you can quite make that out, but it's uh, payment processing and mobile banking uh, are the main clusters there. And finally is the AST taxonomy. So um, there are some similarities between the client taxonomy, AST taxonomy, However, these are much broader uh, buckets, uh, so it can include anything to do with, for example, wireless data cards and devices, rather than uh, something that's uh, wholly applicable to uh, the financial services uh, sector. So um, we can actually go even deeper than that um, and actually talk about uh, what it is that Cypher delivers. So. What we deliver is is exactly a presentation like this, uh, as well as the underlying data uh, and an interactive live Cypher dashboard for you to interrogate this data further. Some of the um, more pertinent analysis you could do uh, on top of just looking for related and unrelated is, uh, for example, we can use our PVIX uh, score factors. So this is a way of assessing quality of the assets, and that will look at uh, forward citations and also which jurisdictions uh, patents are granted in. Um, and for example, we can see here Company A, uh, which is our uh, financial services company, uh, is really quite strong in credit cards, uh, as, as you could probably imagine. Um, whereas um, I should also explain that the scoring here, uh, PVIX, is uh, those two main factors, and they determine a score between. 50 and 100 for um, individual patent families. Uh, so you can see the credit cards uh, really is uh, stronger if you compare it to the intellectual ventures portfolio. Um, on the flip side, the RFID technology uh, that's held in the intellectual ventures portfolio uh, might be uh, slightly stronger than uh, than the company we're looking at here. Uh, the next chart over here is, is the expiry. So uh, a large majority uh, of the assets looking to be looking to expire um, within 2025. Um, and finally, you can also take a look at uh, the breadth of the geographical filing. Uh, so you can see the intellectual ventures portfolio is quite heavily based and oriented uh, around the USA um, with the other 20% spread across the rest of the world. So that's uh, really uh, the core of the uh, Cypher solution. Uh, it's that um, traffic light system of, uh, of red core related technologies. Uh, the amber, which is the uh, more 
on the fringe but still relevant uh, technologies to you and the green the things that you can say well you know uh, let's have an honest conversation about how we want to uh, look at this licensing licensing these assets from you um, you know 64 percent of the patents you you are asserting against us uh, are not relevant to us and before we stop the slide steve can you just go back to that pie chart the showcase example slide eight i mean steve you've been at the the vanguard of presenting some of these solutions uh, in collaboration with with clients is that 64 percent just a quirk of this example or is that kind of irrelevance uh, quantity typical of what you found in these large portfolio assertions i'm not really sure there's such a thing as typical it depends on how um how well curated the asserted set of patents is before they're sent to the client um it certainly we have seen this in the real world and this is obviously a hypothetical example but we have seen similar ratios in the real world but we've also seen cases where there's more and the cases where there's less it just depends on who the other party is and what their what their approach is. If they're trying to drown you in numbers, they'll send over enormous amounts of mostly irrelevant assets. Or if they're trying to be very, very targeted, then they do a better job of selecting them. So I'm not sure there's really such a thing as typical. But this drowning with numbers reflects uh, my real world experience before I got into analytics. I used to support uh, licensing and cross-licensing negotiations and it was the modus operandi for the parties one or more of them to go and come into the room uh, with large portfolios i mean I, I think i have a very clear idea myself but you casper have graded these patents into i quite like the idea of this traffic light system that red looks more relevant to you and therefore might, might be the most pertinent part of the portfolio and you've got this amber zone where you're just making sure uh, what's in the periphery whether it's adjacencies with uh, the clustering you mentioned or the ast product taxonomy uh, which will give you a uh, yet another filter what might that tell you steve about pricing i mean actually using this data in real world negotiations yeah well i mean it's perfectly possible to use this data to negotiate um the a deal because you actually have some information about the relative proportion of um assets in the assertive portfolio and how important they are to your business um you know there can often be stuff in the um in the sort of outer zones of, of relevance which is um still material to you it might just might not be core to your business you know if you're in financial services it might be something relating to atms i don't know which you don't make yourself but they're still a, a key component of your business so it lets you take a much more nuanced view um but most importantly it lets you respond quickly um if you can come back to the asserter in a very short period of time with a i've analyzed the patents you're asserting against me and here's how they break down and here's the ones that i'm interested in and these ones are frankly a bit peripheral to me then it gives you a very very strong position in negotiation and clearly shows the asserter that you've got mastery of the data typically better than they do because it's very difficult for them to work out exactly which of the patents is relevant to your business without access to, to the taxonomy or in-depth knowledge about exactly what technologies you're developing. Right, right. So that's the that's the wonders of automated classification. But I mean, back to you, Casper. Uh, you started the presentation by saying, "Well, we need to identify relevant, and we just take the taxonomy and we run the taxonomy over the IV portfolio, and it comes up with." six percent i wonder whether you could say a little bit more about why that taxonomy exists or when it exists or what you have to do in order to create it yeah certainly i mean the message really here is uh taxonomies don't appear overnight uh, they take uh work so uh the ability to respond quickly and efficiently uh means being prepared and having a taxonomy ready having a strategy ready uh more uh realistically to the ground i suppose within cipher that's uh having the classifiers built that's agreeing a scope with us working with us to build these classifiers to your defined lens of how you see the technologies um and making sure that the classifiers perform uh to your satisfaction and and that we're we're confident in in how they perform um 
which will which will lead you know to this eight percent chunk of you can safely say we're happy with how the classifiers work we're happy with the boundary that we've set using the scope uh, that we work to um, and then we can go ahead and, and come back to to a potential assert and say look th the data here is solid we can we can send that to you uh, but the bottom line is eight percent of it is our core technologies and and the rest of it well we can we can talk about the licensing strategy uh, using that data and of course, if you imagine the numbers here, some version of 10% of 4,000 uh, 4, is 400, uh, and uh, it's a much more manageable number to go and start that secondary analysis, whether it be quality geography time or actually claims charting. I mean, you can, it's, it's a feasible job to go and focus on uh, a licensor's best patents, which in fact is the opposite order to the way licensing was done of old, where you'd start with a large pile and have a couple at the top with claims chart and and ask people to extrapolate because you had two claims chart that every one of the patents underneath were infringed also. But I just want to take a step back, um, directed at Steve. We're, we're, we're talking about classification as if it's lingua franca for the whole of the industry. And, and, and before Cypher, there was no uh, machine learning uh, mapping of patents to technologies. Do you want to just insert a couple of comments definitionally about the difference between what we're suggesting and what might have been a typical approach for people who had wanted to do this using some, I don't know, conventional Boolean approach? Yeah, so if you were going to tackle this problem using a, a Boolean search, you would you would have to build up your uh, to attempt to construct um, queries that match the different parts of your business, or maybe you would analyze your own portfolio to see what the distribution of CPC codes was and look for any common CPC codes in the assertors portfolio but but those, those things carry different risks the it's very difficult to think up boolean searches which will adequately encompass the technologies used by your business there's all kinds of um like I gave the example of the financial services company and ATMs it's probably not something that would be immediately obvious to you and um on the flip side if you try and look to see what CPC codes your own portfolio covers and then try and match them off against the asserted portfolio, you're going to match a, a whole load of stuff which is from different industries or doesn't read onto your, your specific product set. Um, just because CPC codes, some of them are very, very broad and some of them are weirdly specific and there's all kinds of structural problems with CPC codes. Um, so it, it's really very challenging. Um, the I mean the obvious approach is to go through and read them one by one, but the amount of time that takes is just phenomenal, and it's very difficult to respond in an adequate amount of time to an asserter if you have to read a thousand patents. Right, I, mean, I, I think you've definitely done that maths at some time. What it would be like to read four thousand five hundred patents at five minutes a time. I mean, it it is just not. It's just not credible. And I think just a, another comment about this Boolean, I mean, part of the raison d'etre behind Cypher is to make evidence-based decisions, but to make decisions on the basis of evidence requires some trust and credibility. If you decide to go the other route, the keyword search, the CPC code, pull out a bunch of patents and say to the licensor, these are the only patents you have in ATMs, just to stick with that example, and they can credibly uh, uh, show that your your data is is insufficiently accurate. You've just sabotaged the very negotiating strategy that we're trying to suggest uh, to suggest here that you're basing the royalty uh, largely on the ones that are of core relevance, mildly on the ones that are of secondary relevance, and getting the uh, licensor to accept that they should probably have not walked into the room with the other 64%. But but you talk about machine learning um, there, Casper, as if it's a magic wand, you run it, you get a slide, you present it, you walk out, you've saved yourself a bunch of money. But what kind of time is involved in running this process? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, again, it hinges on being prepared, and I'm going to keep banging this point uh, out. Uh, but it's being prepared and having the classifiers uh, built and your portfolio uh, up and running within Cypher. Uh, once we have once we have those key aspects um then it's it's a matter of days of producing this analysis uh so it, it is very very quick uh like i said 
60 million patents an hour. Uh, and then it's just quite a bit of Excel wrangling to produce this data, but uh, uh, I've run it quite a few times now. So, so quite confident uh, in the process is very, uh, very much uh, ironed out. And clearly 60 million patents an hour is not really a relevant stat when we're only looking at 4,000. We're talking about seconds to classify, I assume, 4,500. Yeah, I think that's more of a question for Steve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the the volume of data is not not a challenge for a machine. You know, it's um, it might be five minutes per per person, but if you can farm it out to a thousand machines, it's not it's not very much time. Um, and and just talking about jargon busting on this call, I know this is a solution a cycle solution webinar, so many people uh, will be aware of the work we've done in relation to taxonomies. Steve, I, do you want to just go and talk specifically about the AST product taxonomy, which I think was layer three of the of the gr the grading process that Casper referred to? Yeah, it's a very interesting taxonomy. It covers um, sort of the tech world quite broadly, and sort of goes off into automotive and a few other areas. But it's uh, sort of widely used by Allied Security Trust for tagging assets that come on the market um, and we, we implemented it in cipher for, um, for for them and for their uh, for members but um, it's very useful for this kind of um, analysis because it allows you to cast the net very wide you know, if you are a I can use the ATM example again if you are a financial services company and you want to know you, you ATMs are not part of your core they are part of your core business but they're not part of your core technology so you need to make sure that you sweep up anything which is in these peripheral technologies. It could be as something as simple as networking gear, not critical to your business, but it's important that you acknowledge the relevance. Um, but it's uh, approximately 180 categories across um, I don't know, 15 or 20 um, areas, and uh, it covers a very significant proportion of the world's patents. Um, I, I know well because you and I were involved in the collaboration with Allied Security Trust that that product isn't just called AST, it's actually called Cypher N over D powered by AST. Uh, I'm going to ask you the next geek question as well. Why is it called Cypher N over D and what is the relevance of the D for these kind of calculations? Yeah, well, that's a, uh, that's a, a sort of a... <laughs> Uh, slightly nerdy in joke, but the, the, it stands for numerator of a denominator. And the, the original intention was that, um, and in fact, the primary use case for it is to help with wargaming and negotiating cross licenses. So you can run the, uh, which is obviously a related problem, you can run the classifiers over your own portfolio and the other party, but you can also bring in denominator data. So um, we've got a thousand, they've got 500, and there are um, 16,000 in the world. It gives you some idea of proportionality. And when you're signing the cross license, like how much of the um, how much of the world's assets are you taking under license when you sign this license? And it allows you to set some economic scale on the value of the license and give you more data when you're negotiating. It's widely used in cross license negotiations. And I don't think it is a, a complete tangent. Uh, um, I was on a, an IAM industry webinar moderating a panel involving Audi, Polestar and others. And it came to the question of Avanci uh, licensing a very large portfolio aggregated across a number of the major SEP owners. And the question was asked, how many, how many, what percentage of the, the 4G, 5G patents does Avanci control? Everyone uh, uh, said, I, 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 haven't a, I haven't a clue. I mean, how, how would I know? How would I know how many SEPs they own and where the line was drawn between their SEPs and their non-essential patents? And then the next question that was asked of uh, Matthias Schneider is, how do you know, therefore, that when VW signed the Avanci deal, you're getting a good deal at $15? Because you don't really know what the total bill is. And I think these, these kind of numerator and denominator uh, approaches do take a very significant step. So I don't know whether, Steve, just to round off that discussion, we've detoured into AST and we've come back to the importance of denominators. Do you think that denominator is also relevant when facing off intellectual ventures? You say to them, not only do 
you own this many, but you need to be mindful of what the global population is. It, it could be, yeah. The, um, there's also the, I mean, there are occasions where the asserter is an operating company rather than MPE. In fact, that's the common case. Um, and so there, there are times when you might want to strike a cross, cross license anyway, and then the, the denominator information is critical. Um, it depends whether the other party is behaving like an MPE where there's no counter, if, if they don't have any revenue, they're in severe financial trouble, or if they operate in a sufficiently different industry, it's not always possible to, to form it into a cross license, but, but often it is. And then the information is critical. And, and equally, when you're, as you said, when you're, if you're negotiating a, a license for some few thousand patents, it's important to know what else is out there and, and how much of the world you're getting a license for if you agree to it. Right. So uh, uh, the strong message coming across from, from the pair of you is, is automation and, and efficiency. But I don't know whether, Casper, if I can just ask you the question in relation to the repeatability of the process, the way that Steve presented the data at the beginning, there's you know, 41 percent of, 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 of assertions involve what I might, might call mass portfolios, large, multiple uh, large portfolios. How repeatable is this process? Yeah, that's a great point. The, the process is, is very repeatable. The classifiers and the clustering algorithms uh, actually only work on uh, similarity. They, they ignore factors, uh, as we presented in the, in the secondary analysis that you can do around um, age and quality factors. Uh, so the, you can run this over any portfolio at any point. Uh, whether it's uh, an MPE, uh, whether it's an operating company that may come after you. I think really that's the beauty that once you're prepared that this strategy is versatile enough uh, to work, uh, I mean, not only once, but more than once. Hopefully, you know, you don't get hit more than once, but lightning can tend to strike twice uh, in these inbound assertions. And I think some of the data is pointing to the fact that they are on the up, um, not only from operating companies, but there's there's a lot of sale uh, of patents to uh, non-operating companies as well. Uh, so the likelihood is going up. Uh, really, the the strategy is uh, have a solution in place ahead of time that is versatile. No, I I, I think it's um, the way I. Uh, we'll get on to takeaway messages at the end, but it's just confidence draining for the licensor. They walk through the room uh, with 4,500. Their first sit down meeting is can we make that 450 or whatever? I'm not very good at maths other than 10%, but some number around about 400. Then you go and say to them, and by the way, when you're looking for a long term license, the bulk of your assets expire in that category within five years. So we're not playing you a, a running royalty and we and we're doing the DCF calculations, we're gonna commute from that, that value. And then you had a chart which had geography and said that those families don't even have granted assets in the common case, the majority case outside the United States. So maybe we should take a different attitude towards our, here you go from global revenue to US re revenue. I don't know, Steve, I mean, uh, th there's been a lot, we're writing about it currently for IAM about quality scores. And I know you've implemented Unified Patents, PBIX. I don't know whether, you just want to say a bit about why we've introduced that into Cypher and what the market, how the market has reacted to it. Well, PBIX is very popular. Um, it's uh, quite a, and the, the actual maths behind it are quite complicated, but it's quite easy for people to understand it. It's, it's sort of measuring um, how heavily cited families are compared to other similar families in the same technology and the same age and the same geographies. Um, so it's sort of a very, in, in one sense, it's quite a straightforward and easy to understand metric. And there's quite a lot of evidence that it does correlate to something resembling quality. Of course, it goes without saying that um, these sort of mathematical techniques are not, they're never going to magically tell you, oh, this is the best patent in your portfolio. But but taken in aggregate over um, over over a technology, they are quite good at judging the difference between two different technologies. Um, 
and then there's a number of other quality scores out there but pbix is the one that our clients were most enthusiastic about us implementing and it's been warmly warmly adopted uh, uh, yeah, and, and I think I'd probably just go and drive home that point. Of course, doing the forward citations where all the academic literature is about, there is a signal in there about uh, patents that have they've gone backwards from litigated patents, but whichever way they've come at it, they've ended up with forward citations being relevant. And geography is clearly relevant. You can do the, you can do it in isolation. You could look at forward citations in isolation. Cypher would clearly do that for you. You could look at geography data in isolation, or you can get this industry blend, but I definitely the thing I've enjoyed about it is it's not black box. I mean, a lot in the early days, people were saying random score, no methodology. At least this one is solid around around methodology. So, um, Steve, in many ways, we've, we're we're talking about a, a quite a complicated use case. It's not every day that organisations get approached with large portfolios. I'm not saying it's rare. I'm just saying it's not an everyday occurrence. Uh, we didn't cover this uh, uh, problem of our own accord. We were prompted by uh, real world patent owners who wanted us to solve this problem with analytics. But can you just talk a bit about where the methodology came from in, and in particular maybe a word about optimization? Um, well, the, I think it's it's a sort of natural offshoot when, when people are using um, Cypher to manage their own portfolios and do benchmarking and all the other sort of classic cases. It's sort of an obvious occurrence when, when you get a large portfolio asserted against you. It's like, oh, OK, I can use the same technology to, to help break it down. But then you immediately come into the question of it, it's a bit different when you're designing your own portfolio versus negotiating a license it's kind of more critical that you're aware of the peripheral technologies around your business when, when you're negotiating a license because you don't want to miss things that could turn out to be important later um, so there was some uh, some work needed to develop techniques to to sort of grow the, the pool of patents that we're um, interested in um, the clients are interested in licensing in this in this situation. So it's a sort of different approach, but using very similar technology to our core offerings. Um, and it's definitely a problem that exists more in some industries than others. You know, the, the clients, the way we do a lot of this work for them, tend to tend to all fall within one or two industries. So it's definitely a, a thing which is common in pre um, the current recession. It's more common in some areas than others, but I suspect that with what's happening now, we'll see it becoming more common in more industries. Uh, and uh, the example, Casper, you gave was Intellectual Ventures, which obviously is a, a well-known uh, NPE, and counter-assertion doesn't, uh, doesn't really come into it. But, but Steve, you made the point that operating companies make up a substantial amount of, uh, of the population of people who are bringing large populations to the attention of licensees. I, I'm imagining this helps with counter-assertion assessment as well. Can you just explain how that might work? Yeah, I mean, that's a sort of fairly typical um, Cypher use case. We do a lot, of, um, a lot of work on that in clients where we can um, analyze your portfolio and the, um, the other party's portfolio against the common taxonomy and then um, line that up against the number of assets out there and where the numeration and denominator calculations that we were talking about earlier. Um, that's a sort of more straightforward process and definitely more of an everyday occurrence. Um, but it's another situation where um, being armed with the data is, is critical to negotiating a good deal. And um, all the same kind of analysis, secondary analysis that Casper was showing with um, how long have they got to live, what countries are they granted in, how, how good are they in some sort of quality sense? This is all critical again to negotiating a good deal and being sure that um, it's it's equitable and fair and you are armed with all the information that you needed when it comes to time to put pen to paper. Now there's only one question uh, in the chat channel, but please I do encourage uh, the attendees to 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 give 
uh, Steve and Casper a hard time. So keep those questions coming. This question is about confidence. Um, uh, uh, it says, how can we be confident that ML generates accurate results? Um, well, I mean, that's uh, it's one of the nice things about ML. It's actually very easy to test it. Um, the um, we can run it over any any kind of example portfolio. I mean, typically by the time we're running this process, clients have already been using Cypher for um, you know, some months, so they're they're already happy with the results and they've seen it run over their portfolios and their competitors' port portfolios, and they know it's pulling things up. But part part of the reason for the sort of multi-layered approach, which Casper showed with the the pie chart with the different segments, was to make sure that we absolutely catch things that the problem is not so much the accuracy of the ml it's more where you've got patents which are relevant to your business but not in your core areas of interest they're not not in your taxonomy but they are still things that you depend on to to to, um, to run the business um, so making sure that we sweep up all of those is critical but with the multi-layered approach of finding adjacent technologies to your own portfolio and also dragging in anything that matches the AST product portfolio, product taxonomy. We, we cast the net really wide and identify all kinds of stuff in there that, that could be relevant to you. And then you can look at them in, in case by case basis and say, well, in this case, this technology is not so important to us. But, but, but I mean, uh, uh, to make a statement to the blindingly obvious, me as this notional company A in Casper's example, you find something about biometrics which might exist on, I don't know, there was a lot of credit cards. Let's assume that they, they, there were some credit cards involved in that example and the biometrics were on the credit card. That looks like a pretty core technology. You might view wireless networking as being something of a, of a different order of magnitude. It's much more of a commodity. It shouldn't be something that is asserted against, against a bank or a, or a financial services company. So they should be priced, should very definitely be priced oh. differently. Totally, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Well, look, the, the questions, uh, that was the only one, so as much as I'd like to talk to you for, for hours on this, I think we'll, we'll end, we'll give people back a little bit of their time, but I do want to end uh, with some key takeaways. Casper, I think I'm probably sensing what your key takeaway might be. I, I think so, Nigel, at this point. Uh, I think my takeaway message here really is be prepared. Is, uh develop a robust strategy uh, that is efficient and versatile to respond to assertions ahead of time. And that would include, I assume, within that, design and build your taxonomy so it's ready to be deployed as and when you need it. Precisely. Uh, more than happy to work with uh, anyone that would like to. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure you are. Christmas is coming up. Just what you need, another few taxonomies. Uh, Steve, uh, key takeaway. Yeah. So I think it's, um, I mean, history shows that um, this is, well, well one, it, it's a big problem today that people, people have to deal with, but also it's a high chance that we're going to be seeing an increased rate of, um, of assertion. So it's really something that people should be preparing for and whether they use Cypher or they come up with their own way of dealing with it, have, have a strategy ready to roll so that um, if you face these kinds of issues, you're not um, running around desperately trying to figure out how to deal with it. A, a, a monkey takeaway is almost stemming from the fact that I'm moderating this panel rather than uh, uh, presenting on it. Uh, the number of challenges out there, uh, we started as a company with some real classics, some real core business cases around building uh, patent budgets that made sense, justifying them, rationally deploying assets to, a, the, to where they're needed, to answering some of the foundational questions like how many patents are enough. Uh, we've written extensively on that and how to communicate to the board. This one's a new, uh, a, not a new problem, uh, because as, as I mentioned, piles of paper have been in smoke-filled rooms for, for decades. Uh, but I love, I really love the way that, uh, that, that customers are challenging uh, challenging the Cypher team to adapt the, 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 the processes, the methodologies to get to the so what. The fact that Cypher can classify patterns in whatever speed, Steve, you've got the machine to crank up to isn't interesting unless you've got a so what. And the so what in this case is, uh, uh, is that confidence sapping 
is taking taking that 4,500 down to, and it's all hypothetical. So we've chosen IV with all due respect, with no with no knowledge of the uh, 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 of of any particular negotiations. But if you can take away over half of the portfolio, the the problem uh, is is half as big. And as they say at Christmas, a portfolio halved is probably a royalty halved, and that's a, a good thing. Uh, all that's left for me to do is to thank uh, Steve Casper uh, for, for putting together this presentation. Uh, uh, I found it particularly interesting, and thank you for standing up to my robust and otherwise entirely fair questioning. Uh, last of all, to Francesca and Georgia in the marketing team who've worked tirelessly to make this event possible, and of course, to you, the audience, for attending. Uh, um, just as a final reminder, uh, the video will be and the slides will be shared uh, after this session. Uh, and if you know colleagues who would like to uh, listen to it or have access to the materials, uh, then you know where we are, which is at cipher.ai. For now, thank you very much and good night.